All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the 2020 Tinning Founders Day Osteopathy Lecture. Before I introduce our speaker here, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this activity and the history of the Tinning Founders Day uh, Osteopathy Lecture. So in 2009, the late Fred C. Tinning, PhD, and his wife, Janet, uh, created an endowment at AT Still University Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine that would provide for this annual lecture on osteopathy during Founders Day. Dr. and Mrs. Tinning established the Fred C. Tinning, PhD, President Emeritus Founders Day Osteopathy Lecture because of their strong belief in perpetuating the importance of osteopathic principles and practice. Dr. Tinning was the eighth president of ATSU, serving in that capacity from 1984 through 1996. Because of his exceptional service to the university, the AT Still Board of Trustees named the Tinning Education Center building on the Kirksville campus in his honor. Uh, I'd like to take just a moment uh, of silence here to remember Dr. Tenning, who passed in November of last year. So this will be the first year that Dr. Tenning has not been in attendance of this activity. So if we could just take a moment of silence and reflect on his great service to our profession. All right, thank you so much. So it is now my great pleasure to do uh, the introduction today for our speaker, uh, Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum, DO, FACC, FAHA, and KSUM graduate of the class of 1994, is an attending cardiologist specializing in prevention. She served as director of the Women's Cardiovascular Prevention Health and Wellness at Mount Sinai Heart in New York City after serving as director of Women's Health Heart at Northwell Lenox Hill. She is the author of Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum's Heart Book, Every Woman's Guide to Her Heart Healthy Life. Dr. Steinbaum has been awarded a New York Times Super Doctor and the New York Magazine's prestigious Best Doctors in the New York edition. Dr. Steinbaum is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association. She is a national spokesperson for the Go Red for Women campaign and chairperson of the Go Red for Women in New York City. She's on the New York board of the American Heart Association and recently was named to the Scientific Advisory Board of the Women's Heart Alliance. Dr. Steinbaum has devoted her career to the treatment of heart disease. She's a frequent guest on network television shows, including The Doctors, Good Morning America, and The View, and frequently on the Today Show. Uh, some recent highlights have included her speaking at the United Nations Ideagen Empowering Women and Girls 2030 Summit. And these are just a very few of her honors and recognitions and contributions to uh, healthcare and particularly women's health and cardiology in the country and across the world. Um, she has uh, devoted her life to this philosophy and practice of living from the heart. And I can tell you, this is a truly remarkable woman. I am so, uh, you know, honored to be able to introduce her today because I know her as not just an incredible physician, uh, but also as an incredible daughter, mother, and just all around person. And we are so proud to call her our own. So I'm grateful today to introduce to you, Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum. Welcome and thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Wilson, for the introduction and for having me a part of this day. I had the honor and privilege to know Dr. Tinning and to really see his passion for osteopathic medicine. He was a wonderful man, and I'm so honored to be speaking on behalf of, of his legacy um, because he meant so much to me and so much to so many people. Thanks for having me. So I can't wait to talk to you about my career and um, I'm just gonna pull up my slides. Okay, let's get started. 
So I'd like to talk to you about my philosophy of living from the heart because it really is an osteopathic approach to heart disease. My story begins after I left Kirksville and came back to New York City where I did a rotating internship and then a residency in internal medicine. I didn't really know what I was going to do, but there was a day that I was in the emergency room and a 53 year old woman was wheeled in. She was very uncomfortable. She was sweating, vomiting. She was kind of holding her chest and her stomach and, and she was clearly sick and she was evaluated in the emergency room by the doctors that I really respected so much. They were my mentors, my teachers. And she was given the diagnosis of gastroenteritis and she was put in the corner where she proceeded to have a heart attack in front of our eyes. Now, I don't know if you've all heard of Oprah's aha moment. Well, I had that aha moment. It was like everything stopped and I, saw, I thought to myself, Here's this young woman who had a heart attack in front of us. Does anyone else see what's going on here? And the reality was, no, there wasn't such a thing as women in heart disease at that time. And as I was graduating my fellowship in 1994, there were only 13% of cardiologists who were women. I then decided that I wanted to do a fellowship in women and heart disease. So I went to my chief of cardiology and I said, I, I wanna do this fellowship. And he said to me, well, there's no such thing. I said, okay, let me think about this. If there's no such thing as women and heart disease, if I could prevent heart disease in women, then maybe they won't get sick and die like I kept seeing in the emergency room. So I said, I wanna do a preventive cardiology fellowship. And he said to me, well, there's no such thing. I thought that's crazy because what I was seeing was women who had heart attacks, who were diagnosed with heart failure, who had bypass surgery or even chest pain, had worse outcomes than men. They were dying more often than the men who tended to really recover quicker and be discharged from the hospital. But this is what was going on. Heart disease prevention in the 1960s, here is the American Heart Association's first conference for women on heart disease, and it was entitled Hearts and Husbands, The Way to a Man's Heart. Well, we think, all right, that's the 1960s, but things got better, right? In fact, they did not. Heart disease prevention in the 1990s, guess what that was on the cover of Reader's Digest? Is your husband headed for a heart attack? We didn't get very far, but then all of a sudden things started changing in the 90s. And this is when I got into a preventive cardiology fellowship that was started and CGME approved by my chief of cardiology. And there on the cover of Time Magazine, Women and Heart Disease. This is when my training began. That was also the beginning of awareness. Glamour Magazine jumped on board as part of the Red Dress campaign and really looked at educating women and empowering women to understand her risk of heart disease. Then Barbara Bush, she joined and she started speaking out about women and heart disease. The first lady of heart health, in fact, was at the first fashion show for the red dress campaign for awareness. I remember seeing her there and thinking to myself, if she's here, the word is gonna get out. But at the time, there was this gender bias in the treatment of women. The community has approached women's health almost with a bikini approach, looking essentially at the breast and reproduction, reproductive system and almost ignoring the rest of the woman as part of women's health. Now let's think about this. This is this truly allopathic approach to disease. Women were not looked at holistically. They were look at, looked at as their organ systems, their body parts. This is a diseased approach. And what happened was women were getting sick with heart disease. They weren't even looked at as having hearts. 
But in the 1990s, Dr. Bernadine Healy became the first women's director of the NIH and developed the Office of Research on Women's Health. This was the first time that there was a research arm through the NIH to address diseases, disorders, and conditions that affected women. But what happened before the 90s is all that research were done, was done on men. So by the time that women were looked at, we realized more women were dying of heart disease. In fact, more women die of heart disease than all cancers combined. Among women ages 20 and older, almost 45% have some form of cardiovascular disease. That's over 56 million women in the US. And notice the states in red, right in the middle of the country. By the numbers, we know that heart disease is the number one killer of all women. Greater than 52% of hypertension deaths are in women and less than 40% of cardiovascular research participants are made up of women. So all this research was done, but not on women, and the women have been suffering. But this was the statistic that changed my career. 64% of women, the first symptom of heart disease was sudden cardiac death. Now, prevention, is the key because what we were seeing was there not, was not even time to make a diagnosis and to treat this treatment paradigm it was not working and we needed to focus on prevention the other part of it was the physicians were not aware they weren't even aware of the guidelines about women and heart disease and i will tell you this was in 2005 the guidelines of prevention about hypertension, focusing on women, PCPs and OBGYNs who are really on the ground floor, were not aware. And not only that, published in 2016, that women who have heart disease were less likely to be given a catheterization, to be following the guidelines instituted by the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology, Women have been undertreated, underdiagnosed, given less life-saving medication like aspirins, beta blockers, statins to decrease cholesterol. They were sent for life-saving procedures less often than men. And these differences have intensified the outcomes. We go back May 2017 and look at the doctors. Let's talk about, has there been change over a decade? Well, here's the reality. Cardiovascular and disease in women was not the top concern for women or their physicians. There was this stigma about body weight. It, it was a barrier to really talk about a risk factor, a major risk factor for heart disease that increases blood pressure, increases the risk of diabetes. The physicians felt not trained to talk about it. And the women themselves didn't ask. Only 50% knew that heart disease was her greatest risk. This concern about weight was the pervasive piece that doctors talked to the women patients about. But it wasn't about the life-saving issues that deal with heart disease. So let's step back. What is this prevention thing I'm talking about? What is coronary artery disease? Well, it's buildup of plaque in the arteries. It's buildup of cholesterol and fibrous tissue, inflammatory cells, and it begins decades and decades before it actually develops. So we have time. We have time to start early in life because it begins with endothelial dysfunction or problems with the lining of the artery. The lining of the artery is one cell layer thick. It protects the artery from the cholesterol, from the blood pressure, from the sugars, from all these risk factors that lead to heart disease. See, what happens with heart disease is this lining of the artery becomes stiff, becomes damaged. It's like sandpaper that develops against this lining. And these micro tears lead to 
areas in the artery where there's space for the cholesterol goes to go inside. When the cholesterol goes inside, the body says, hey, this doesn't belong here. So it sends cells to get rid of those cells. Those cells eat up the cholesterol kind of like Pac-Man does, and it becomes macrophages or foam cells. These foam cells are fluffy inflammatory cells that start developing plaque. And what happens with this plaque is collagenase and metalloproteinases, all of these other cells come together to form this plaque. But once these other cells come, the plaque can become unstable and lead to rupture. But what we know is this plaque develops very early. This study looks at young people starting at the age of 15 who died of traumatic deaths. We see in yellow, light yellow to orange to that darker area, the beginning of plaque in the artery beginning with this light yellow stage at the age of 15 years old. So we know that plaque begins young and takes a long time for it to show up. But there are nine modifiable risk factors that cause 90% of initial heart attacks. Nine of those are in our control. It is empowering to think that we can help people's lives be changed by changing these risk factors 90% of the time. High cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, abdominal obesity, sedentary lifestyle, a diet low in fruits and vegetables, alcohol intake, and psychosocial risk factors, they are actually all in our control. And 90% of the time, we can change the outcome. The other piece is family history, and we can't deny the importance of family history, but 90% of the time, it's up to us. So let's look at these risk factors. Well, we talked about those top nine, but there are others that play a role. There's inflammation, there's depression, there's stress, there's anxiety, and there's social isolation. And certainly during COVID, we've had some issues with social isolation. But there's some other emerging risk factors that we are aware of when it comes to women. Lupus or inflammatory diseases, gestational diabetes, hypertension in pregnancy, early menopause, or depression. But what we learned is that it's not just the risk factors that develop in women later in life. We learned that we have to look at a woman's life from the time that she's in her 20s and 30s, that it's the lifespan of a woman that develops heart disease. It's no longer an older woman's disease because what happened during pregnancy when she was young makes a difference. So all of a sudden, we're developing a holistic view of how women's lives affect their hearts. We also understand that arteries are from the head to the toes. So it's not just the coronary arteries that have endothelial linings. It's the arteries that go to the brain, the carotid arteries. It's the arteries in the brain. It's the arteries to the kidney, the eyes, the liver, the legs. But when I say we need to live from the heart, we need to take care of our heart. And if we do, it's going to take care of every other system. Because again, we have arteries from head to toe and we need to look at every single patient holistically like this. But many heart attacks happen, as I mentioned, when plaque develops. And you can see in, on the left, the beginning of the plaque formation with cholesterol inside and all of these cells that go inside. But when someone has a heart attack, this plaque ruptures. And when this plaque ruptures, all of this substance comes out of the plaque and the body realizes this isn't normal. So it tries to seal it up with platelets, but that artery is really tiny. And so those platelets come together to seal it up and it blocks off blood flow to the muscle of the heart. And that is when a heart attack develops. So what happens now is we go to the cath lab and here is an angiogram and you see that blocked artery, there's no blood flow. So we put in a stent in that area and you can see blood flow is restored 
when that stent went in. But does that stent cure us of coronary artery disease? Does that actually fix the problem? No, it's just a Band-Aid, it's a cast, it's, it's a modality that, that sur helps us survive when the blood flow is not there in that artery, but it doesn't change the disease process. At one point, we thought stents were life-saving and research has shown stents only save lives in the setting of an acute heart attack, like I showed you, but it does not change the outcomes of people who have coronary artery does, disease. It doesn't fix the problem because unless you fix the problem, with the endothelium, unless you fix those risk factors that lead to heart disease, you're not really changing the problem at all. You're not treating the issue because you're not treating the whole patient. So let's get back to the endothelium. Let's talk about the lining of the artery. How do we take care of it? How do we actually prevent heart disease the right way? Well, it wasn't until 2006, until the WISE trial, that looked at women in heart disease in a different way. See, women have these symptoms of chest pain and they were sent for angiograms. And those angiograms looked normal. Those angiograms didn't show plaque in the arteries. So they were told that they had normal caths. Then they were told oftentimes, you're fine, you're okay, you're just anxious, depressed, and they were sent home. And oftentimes these women did not do well. Study was then done, this WISE trial, that looked at the arteries. It looked at the health of the arteries by injecting acetylcholine and looking at the arteries and whether or not they dilated. And in fact, they didn't. And in fact, it showed the reverse. What we saw in that study was that men get heart disease and coronary artery disease in one distinct location where women's disease is diffuse throughout the arteries. Now, why does that matter? Because when you looked inside, those women's arteries look normal because the catheterization, the nuclear stress test, the way that we diagnosed coronary artery disease compared abnormal to normal. With the women, there was actually no normal to compare, the whole thing was abnormal. In men, that distinct abnormality was so easy to see that we could then treat the problem. With stress testing, a blockage needed to be distinct, 70% or greater, to become abnormal. So it's hard to diagnose heart disease and coronary artery disease in women because of the nature of the disease. But when it's diagnosed, if we fix the endothelium, we would fix all of these problems. The most interesting thing is that again, with a stress test, we're diagnosing blockages at 70% or greater. But most heart attacks happen at 30 to 50%. So what are we trying to find? We're trying to find disease that's advanced that's actually not causing the problem. So a treatment disease strategy isn't really the answer. Prevention is the answer. I can't seem to lose weight, doctor. I tried everything short of diet and exercise. Well, we gotta learn to talk to our patients, to explain to them that this is in their control. We get to have a relationship with our patients and become part of their team and part of their strategy to become as healthy as they can. Does digestion count as exercise? No, I tell everyone we've got to put an effort in. So what do we do? We put our patients in the center of the story. We partner with our, become, with our patients. We become teammates and we empower them to modify these risk factors, to take charge of their health with diet, and with exercise, and the outcomes of their lives will change. Hippocrates said, nearly 2,400 years ago, 
if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little and not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. Well, let's look at exercise. I think exercise is by far the best medication. It does everything. It decreases blood pressure, decreases cholesterol, it improves the HDL, the good cholesterol, decreases heart rate, prevents osteoporosis, makes us feel better. It decreases diabetes and decreases weight. So it takes care of all of these risk factors that lead to heart disease. I always say exercise is the best medication and if you can get your patients to exercise, we can help them change those risk factors. And then there's human nature and we definitely need to fight against human nature. Is sitting the new smoking? Studies show that low physical fitness is associated with an increased mortality, but higher fitness levels is associated with longevity. So getting our patients to exercise is one of the most critical pieces we can show them and give them for a heart healthy life. I exercised once, but found that I was allergic to it. My skin flushed and my heart raced. I got sweaty and short of breath, very dangerous. You gotta teach your patients what exercise means and how to do it. And there's actually ways to do that. Remind them that for every hour spent in front of the TV, there's an 11% increased risk of death from all causes, but there's an 18% increased risk of cardiovascular disease related death. If that isn't motivation to get off the couch at night, I don't know what is. And it's actually better to be fit than anything. So this study looked at fitness versus fatness. There were people who were lean, but out of shape, and some that were obese, but in shape. And it turns out that those patients that were obese, but were fit, did better. So promoting exercise for your patients is critical. Through the American Heart Associations, the guidelines say that moderate intensity aerobic activity, and that's 150 minutes per week, is ideal. Intense and vigorous aerobic activity is 75 minutes per week and two days per week of muscle strengthening activity. Talking to your patients about what that means, how to exercise becomes so important. What I tell my patients is if you can have a conversation, but it's hard to finish a sentence a little bit like this, that is the sweet spot for exercise. We can actually assess this through a cardiopulmonary exercise test, looking at something called VO2 max. And increasing the VO2 max decreases cardiovascular mortality by almost 5% and decreases all cause mortality by as much as 3%, and actually decreases cancer mortality by as much as 4%. So, exercise is a significant part of overall health. So let's talk about diet. The standard typical Western diet increases heart attacks by 30%. That's the fried food, the salty snacks, the meats, and a healthy diet lowers the risk of heart disease by 30%. Here's the truth. We don't learn enough about diet through our training that we have to really incorporate our knowledge of diet to understand how to maximize health. The nutrients that we can get from our diet is essential to really help people become as healthy as they can be. We see this across the board in people that live in areas where there's tons of fast food, there's actually a greater risk of cardiovascular disease. And in fact, people living in regions with greater than 33 fast food chains, there's a 13% greater odds of having a stroke. So what happens, people get up in the morning, they don't make breakfast, they're running late, they grab the latest fast food they can, they can find, 
pop it in their mouths. And what happens is this salt, the fried foods, the processed foods lead to an increase in cholesterol, an increase in sugars, an increase in blood pressure. Then what happens? The lining of the artery becomes damaged. That damaged endothelium then leads to atherosclerosis. And the story goes on and on. What's happened is that there's been a change in our food. There was this whole push to decrease the amount of fats that we thought low fat food was essential for preventing heart disease. When that happened, there was an increase in our sugar content by as much as one third. What happened then is this is the first generation of children that will live shorter lifespans than, there's a, than their parents. There's been such a significant increase in obesity and diabetes in young people because of this change in diet. Our recommendations are six to nine teaspoons a day. There's four grams of sugar in one teaspoon. I tell you this because I want you to start looking at the labels on some of the foods. Look at salad dressings. Look at sauces. Look at the packaged food that we buy and you're gonna see the hidden sugars in there and the hidden sugars in something as simple as bread that we buy packaged. These hidden sugars have truly changed the outcome of health in this country. Not to mention the supersized everything, including soft drinks. Sometimes late night food cravings simply mean you need to go to sleep earlier. I think one of the funniest things as you get to learn about your patients is hopefully you talk to them and learn about their habits and how they live. And I had one patient who was telling me that every night her children would go to sleep and after they went to bed, she did the laundry, she cleaned the house, and she would snack as she was going along. And we figured out that she was eating 1,200 calories after 9 p.m. And joking around, I said to her, I have a great solution. Don't go on a diet. Just go to sleep and stop eating. Well, about two months later, she came back in and she lost about 15 pounds. Knowing someone's habits and knowing how your patients actually live can change their lives. You just have to talk to them and have a relationship with them. And it's amazing what could happen. So the guidelines look like this. Half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables, super colorful with multi-grains and a very small amount of protein and a very small amount of low fat dairy. Guidelines were released not too long ago that talked about the difference between good fats and bad fats. These good fats are things like omega-3 fatty acids. Eggs are now considered a good fat. I will tell you that varies by the year. Um, sugars are considered fairly evil. Not eating sugar is very important. And also they talked about bad fats and those, those are things like meats and processed foods. Not all fat is created equal and omega-3 fatty acids are the healthiest fats for you. That includes fish and two servings per, of fish per week are recommended. Those are fatty fish like mackerel and herring, salmon, trout, sardines, tuna, and anchovies and caviar. And also a high fiber diet is very important for decreasing cholesterol, decreasing triglycerides, and very, very helpful to manage weight. But one of the most compelling diets is the Mediterranean diet. The old USDA pyramid is on the left and the Mediterranean diet is on the right. And the Mediterranean diet is filled with fruits and vegetables and a very small amount of saturated fat. But the trial that really struck me was from 1999, the Lyon Diet Heart Study, looking at the Mediterranean diet. And in this particular study, the incidence of car coronary artery disease was decreased by 70%. A recent trial called the, the PREDIMED trial looked at over 7,000 women and men and in this study, olive oil was used as well as nuts 
and it reduced the incidence of heart attack and stroke and cardiovascular death by as much as 30%. This diet was filled with the whole grains and fiber, legumes and nuts and oats and barley, and limiting the red meat, limiting the alcohol, increasing the fruits and vegetables and nuts and omega-3s. And there was that 30% reduction. Through the American Heart Association, we talked about the DASH diet, again, high in fruits and vegetables, and really this the nutrients of calcium, potassium, fiber, magnesium, and vitamins A, C, and E. And basically there was a significant reduction. This really specifically looked at women, 24% reduction in fatal and non-fatal coronary artery disease and an 18% reduction in stroke. Now, if you think about it, I just talked to you about diet and exercise. If I can give that to my patients and I can change their outcomes, this is about prevention. But as I said earlier, we have to look at people holistically. We can't just talk about their lives in terms of how they eat and how they exercise. We need to talk about their stress and how they think and how they live their lives. Because stress is one of the most pervasive parts of a person's life that increases disease. You know, it often starts in the mind. They become worried and negative and indecisive and their judgments off and their emotions change. They become depressed and anxious, sometimes isolated, irritable, and their behaviors change. They make bad choices. That's when overeating happens. That's when this comfort food happens. That's when they might drink too much or not be able to sleep. And then in their bodies, they have symptoms. They get chest pain or, or headaches or diarrhea or palpitations. But eventually this stress can lead to heart disease. So is stress kind of the new smoking? Well, let's talk about the stress response for a second. What happens? These stress hormones are produced by the adrenal glands. They're catecholamines, that's epinephrine and norepinephrine that are produced. And there's also corticosteroids, which trigger the inflammatory system. So I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit what medical school was like for me. The stressor. The stressor was an exam. We get ready, we start studying, we buckle down. We can do it, we can get through it. The exam's on Friday, we get through the week, we're okay, we take the exam and then what happens? Exhaustion. And then we develop a cold. We get through it and all of those Hormones keep us going until we fall apart. Well, let's go over this stress response. That life stressor is a threat. The hippocampus understands that threat. The limbic system triggers that physical response. The reticular activating system connects that mind and the body. And the hypothalamus leads to an endocrine release of hormones and an autonomic nervous system release of epinephrine and norepinephrine triggering the sympathetic nervous system. What happens is we get the release of cortisol with, which depletes our immune system. And we get the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine increasing our sympathetic nervous system, increasing our blood pressure, increasing our heart rate. But this is a non-sustainable way to live because eventually we get sick. So this mind-body connection is not something we can ignore. We need to actually talk to patients about how they feel. We need to discuss their lives and how they think. Are they sleeping? Because with an increase in stress, there's a decrease in sleep. And the need for sleep is about seven and a half hours. I will tell you in New York City, there aren't many of my patients that are sleeping seven and a half hours. But those that sleep less than six are at greater risk, and those that sleep greater than nine and a half are also at greater risk. But let's go through this. What happens with stress? I want you to notice that for women, stress is a more significant risk factor. Percent of Americans who felt depressed or sad who were stressed, more women than men, felt nervous or anxious, 40% of women versus 29% of men. 
who felt worried. 35% of women versus 25% of men felt overwhelmed. 40% of women, 24% of men. But by the way, both men and women feel this way. Fatigue, lay awake at night. Women in depression is a reality and it affects their hearts. It's twofold more prevalent in women and it increases the risk of heart attack and death by as much as 50%. It's a powerful predictor of early onset heart attacks. We have to tell patients to stay in the present. We really can't think about the future, it makes us anxious. If we think about the past, it makes us depressed. But having these conversations do matter. I talk to patients about that mindfulness, about staying in the moment, staying present. It decreases the stress response. It decreases that epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. It decreases inflammation and improves overall well being. I talk to them about breathing, which really stops that epinephrine and norepinephrine. In fact, we know that a panic attack starts with an increase in respiratory rate. That if we can actually teach someone how to simply breathe, we can stop a panic attack. We can stop the cycle of stress. We can decrease their blood pressure. We talk about gratitude. Believe it or not, a study was done called the GRACE study, Gratitude Research in Acute Coronary Events. So these patients wrote letters to their doctors and nurses who took care of them, thanking them. It was associated with a better quality of life. They did better. They ate better. They exercised better. They had less depression and anxiety, and they were more emotionally resilient. Their compliance was better just by being thankful. I tell all my patients every night before you go to sleep, write three to five things down that you're thankful for. See how you feel. See if it changes how you feel about your life. Heart disease isn't easy. And giving a gratitude task actually changes how people feel. I talk about meditation. A scientific statement was released by the American Heart Association that looked about at meditation about this emotional regulation. There was a decrease in physiologic stress, a decrease in stress, anxiety, and depression. People slept better, and there was an improvement in their overall well-being. And there was a significant reduction in blood pressure and inflammation and a decrease in smoking. There's tons of different kinds of meditation out there that some resonate with some patients more than others. But when people have stress, they need a tool and something to help them. And the American Heart Association jumped on that bandwagon. Social support is also important. People with larger social support networks experience lower mortality rates. Well, during this time, we weren't around our social support, some of us, and somewhat isolated. I was speaking to so many different groups over this time. Corporations and businesses were calling me, how do we tell our employees to stay safe? It seems that emotionally our country has really been going through a lot. And it, it became a reality to the companies that called me that we needed to address it in some way to keep people healthy and to keep people going. I put up this slide and everyone laughed we got to send each other hugs any way we can, whether that's getting on the phone or Zoom calls like today. And marriage satisfaction, the relationships, satisfying relationships actually slow the progression of heart conditions. Laughter is so important. And I said also during this time, everyone's on Netflix, get rid of the sad movies and watch a happy one because laughter increases blood flow and dilates those arteries and really helps our, how we perceive ourselves and, and the world around us. I wanna do a small experiment. I'm gonna show you a series of faces. I want your eyes to be drawn to the faces that you see first. Don't think about it too much. Just let your eyes go to where they want.
So there were happy faces and there were sad faces, positive faces and negative faces. Turns out as we grow older, we tend to see the negative. We can figure out all the ways that things are gonna go wrong or be bad or not turn out the right way. As we get older, our biases tend to go towards the negative. When babies are small, you go up to them and say goo goo and smile and they look at you and they smile back. We learn over time to become pessimistic. Turns out that how we wake up every day, whether the glass is half full or half empty makes a difference. It turns out that optimism changes the outcome, that optimism can decrease the risk of cardiovascular events. We can actually change our brain to become glass half full versus half empty. And we have to do that as we get older because the reverse is more likely. And it turns out that purpose in life is so critically important. Those people who have a purpose in life have a decrease in mortality. I will tell you that I feel so lucky in knowing that I feel like I am here for a reason. I want each and every one of you to know and to find your purpose in life. What, how do you want to become a DO? How do you want to have a relationship with your patients? How do you want to save lives? In what way do you want to have an impact? Find your purpose, because not only is that going to benefit your patients, but it is going to benefit you. I want to talk a little bit about COVID and what happened during this pandemic that we've all been watching in real time. In March, we heard about the pulmonary effects of COVID. We heard that this new virus, this novel coronavirus was affecting people's lungs. They were being intubated and they were dying. And then time went on and we found out about this cytokine storm, this huge inflammatory response that certain people were developing, these young men that were not doing very well who were otherwise healthy. We heard about people with hypertension and obesity who were more likely to die. And as we started seeing this coronavirus and the effects of it on our patients, we realized that it was partly because the endothelium. People actually did worse when they had endothelial dysfunction. We started seeing that it wasn't from pneumonia they were dying from, but it was from hypercoagulability. It was from damage to the endothelium. And in fact, studies have shown that patients who are on blood pressure medication, who are on statins to lower their cholesterol, actually have better outcomes when they do get COVID. It turns out that endothelial health is the cornerstone to recovering from a COVID-19 infection. If that doesn't bring us full circle to why we need to manage and deal with prevention, I don't know what does. It's about osteopathy. My whole career has been based in osteopathy. I never understood why we we're putting stents in arteries when holistically there was disease throughout the entire system that the arteries from head to toe with the endothelium from head to toe, that that was the problem, that that stent was a band-aid, that we needed to address the disease process. The philosophy of osteopathy is expansive. It's holistic. It's focused on the entire patient with specific attention to the cause of the disease. Is it the diet? Is it the exercise? Is it the stress? Is it the family history? Is it that they just didn't go to bed on time? Is it that they're not sleeping? Because you know what I know 
that you're going to learn, the body is a unit and the person represents a combination of body, of mind, of spirit. The body is capable of self-regulation, self-healing, and health and maintenance. And our job as osteopathic physicians is to tie this all together to bring health and wellness to our patients. We need to change healthcare in this country. It is a broken system that is disease driven. We are driven by a disease and treatment paradigm that has been failing our patients. But as osteopaths, we get to look at things differently. We get to see the cause, the reason. We get to understand the connection and create strategies to help people become well. I think if A.T. Still and I knew each other, we would have gotten along really well. To find health should be the object of the physician. Anyone can find disease. I am so excited for the journey that you're all on to really change how healthcare should be, isn't delivered and should be delivered. But as osteopaths, you get to deliver it the way that it should be. This quote is from my book, live truthfully, authentically, and honestly, drawing strength and consolation from work, family, love, and health, cultivate and nurture those things, not from your head where logic always rules, but from your heart where you can feel what is right and real for you. Live that way and chances are things are going to be just fine. I think my book, my approach, my life, it's really been an osteopathic view of how to truly manage cardiovascular disease in not just women, but it's been particularly important for women because without this approach, more women have been dying of heart disease than all cancers combined. I wish you all, all the luck in the world and thanks for having me. Um, now we'll open up for questions. Can you hear me, Dr. Steinbach? I can. Okay. Our first question is, um, when working with patients who do not want to change themselves, how can we help improve our patient's lifestyle while respecting their autonomy? So the great thing that we do have now is testing and technology that can actually show and demonstrate to patients the effect of their lifestyle on their heart. There's one test that I do called a coronary artery calcium score that looks for calcification in the arteries. The only reason there's calcification in the arteries is if they're atherosclerosis. When I can show people the effects of their lifestyle tangibly, objectively on their arteries, and they actually can see it and understand it, and I get to tell them this is in your control. You don't have to have the same heart disease your father had. You don't have to live the way your mother did. It becomes more empowering. And the other piece is you don't give them this big picture of how they need to change their lives, but give them small steps. So I had a patient come in yesterday and she's about 60 pounds overweight. She's very short of breath. She really can't exercise very well. And all I said to her is, are you drinking a lot of soda? And she said, yes. And I said, let's start there. Let's just get rid of the soda. These small changes have huge impacts on outcome. And that's what I do. I start small, I become a partner, I check in with them, they come back, I, I encourage them, motivate them, and you have to become a partner in this or else patients aren't gonna listen. They're not gonna see the benefit. They're just gonna wanna do what they usually do. 
Thank you. Our, our next question is, um, what is your opinion on the extent of long-term effects of the COVID lockdown on the heart health of Americans? So I think this question is probably the most profound thing that we're looking at right now. There's two parts to this. Um, there are those people who've had COVID that I am seeing after effects um, on their hearts. I'm seeing a lot of pericarditis, inflammation. Some of these patients are really suffering with inflammatory processes and the effects of that on the heart. There's shortness of breath, fatigue. There's a, a, some of these patients really exercise tolerance has decreased. There's been myocarditis. So I think the virus itself is an issue. The other part is that during lockdown, a lot of people stopped taking care of themselves. They either started eating too much, not exercising. They stopped monitoring their sugars or getting their blood checked or their blood pressure checked. As their weight went up, they became more hypertensive. As their weight went up, their sugars went up. So all the things that have been managed these people are now becoming sick. I had a patient who sent me an email and she said, can you give me a sleeping pill? I can't sleep at night. This is a patient with heart failure and she was actually in fulminant heart failure so she couldn't lie down to sleep. But it wasn't until having that conversation with her that I found out how short of breath she was. So we're seeing worsening of a lot of the chronic illnesses because of this lockdown. And we are really suffering from that and patients are suffering from that right now. Thank you for that. Our next question is, are there any known correlations between high caffeine consumption and cardiovascular disease? So there's been multiple studies on this, um, and, and they're all a little different in their outcomes. Some shit say caffeine is bad for you, coffee specifically I'm talking about, and some say it's good for you. Caffeine itself is a stimulant, and as a stimulant, it sometimes can trigger an arrhythmia. Um, I know that some of my patients will have three cups of coffee, and they'll have a palpitations, but in it in and of itself, it doesn't cause coronary artery disease. Thank you. Uh, next question is, um, what is your view regarding a healthy vegan diet and heart health versus diets that include limited protein, for example, pescatarian? So vegan diets are really challenging because we're missing some of the um, good fats, those omega-3 fatty acids are not manufactured by the body. We have to get them through our diet. And those omega-3s are in things like olive oil and avocados, um, but the, they tend not to be as efficient for metabolism and incorporation as in the form of fish. For my patients, I recommend the Mediterranean diet in the form of mostly vegetarian with fish every so often. And this is the, the group that I do recommend supplements in are often those people who are vegetarian or vegan just to make sure that they get everything they need in their, in their diets. And if they don't get it through the food to get it through supplementation. Okay, our next question is, what are your thoughts on so many hospitals providing easy access to the foods and drinks you discussed with high sugar and unhealthy fats? Um, has there been a push to get rid of this standard? I, yes, it's appalling. I think one of the most shocking things, I've been asked to speak at multiple different groups and I would go to these groups like for a lunch meeting and they're serving deli meats. And I, you know, I'd walk in and say, really, or really, did you know who I was? But the hospitals are doing it. There has been a push to shift. And in fact, at one of the hospitals I worked at, they developed a garden on the roof. And some of the, the herbs that they grew and vegetables they grew, they started using in the kitchen. So there is definitely a shift. Food is medicine. That really our hospitals is where we need to focus on this, especially for our patients. 
it's taking time, but I agree with you. There has to be a shift. Um, our next question, um, by knowing what we know today about the importance of diet and exercise, I believe it is important to incorporate this topic into our educational system to provide everyone with the basic knowledge about healthy eating and lifestyle, especially for our student doctors who will need to be role models and teachers to their patients. How do you think we can go about and bring this change to our educational system and to our med schools? Well, that's kind of why I decided to talk about it today. I think that it's a problem. It's a problem because doctors have not learned about this in school, so they really don't know this information. I did this preventive cardiology fellowship and had the gift of learning about diet and learning about exercise. But I do think that we need to change our system of education to provide this information. I think it is so incredibly important to discuss it. I wanted to bring it to you today because it has not been standardly part of the curriculum, but either has women and heart disease been part of the curriculum, at least when I was going through school, and I'm sure it's more incorporated, but the nuances about it have not been. So I think there does need to be an inclusion and incorporation of all of this in medical school curriculums, and we just have to push for it um, and definitely, I wanted to bring attention to it um, through this talk, so perhaps it'll change right now. Thank you. Our next question is, um, would using a calcium score then become more valid for diagnosis, diagnosis of CAD? What are your thoughts on the new Warrior study using high-dose um, artivistatin and ACEI in females with angina and non-obstructive CAD on cardiovascular mortality outcomes? So a calcium score is a wonderful screening test to just show that there's plaque in the arteries. The thing about it is it only shows if there's hardened plaque and it doesn't show if there's soft plaque. So having a normal calcium score doesn't mean that there's not endothelial disease or doesn't mean that there isn't soft plaque in the artery. What the trial using statins, cholesterol lowering medications and ACE inhibitors are about is really about getting endothelial health. So statins decrease inflammation and decrease cholesterol. They don't just lower the LDL number, they actually stabilize plaque and decrease inflammation. And ACE inhibitors and ARBs work on the endothelial lining by dilating them and actually maintaining health. So for patients and women specifically who have microvascular disease, statins and ACE inhibitors or ARBs is part of the preventive strategy for endothelial health, and that's why they improve outcomes. The more that we learn about endothelial health and microvascular disease, the more we know how to treat it. So we go to that diet, we go to that exercise, and then we go to the medications that can help support us and that in this study was in the form of statins and ACE inhibitors. Thank you. Um, in recent years, the popularity of plant-based diets has increased tremendously. Having touched on the Mediterranean diet and given the popularity of plant-based celebrity physicians like cardiologist Joel Kahn, what is your opinion on plant-based nutrition from a clinical perspective? I think plant-based nutrition is probably one of the most important things we could talk to our patients about, um, not only for themselves, but there's so much research out there um, on its effect on climate change, separate issue. But I think that for our patients, um, promoting a plant-based diet, primarily plant-based diet, is probably the best way to go across the board. Thank you. Next question. Uh, musculoskeletal caused chest pain is common. Does your osteopathic background help you with this type of chest pain? Yes, and it's absolutely my favorite thing because I will get a call from a very nervous, panicked family practitioner and internist and saying, oh my goodness, my patient has chest pain. Should I send 
him or her to the hospital and I'll say, send them over. And I can actually find a lesion at T4 and say, you know what, you're good. This is musculoskeletal. I see a lot of costochondritis that mimics angina. That's actually not angina. It is costochondritis and it's inflammation. So I think as an osteopath, putting my hands on patients, being able to examine them, being able to understand where tender points are, where inflammation is, you know, really getting that whole big picture of the patient is huge. And I'll call back um, the physician and say, it's not a big deal. It's musculoskeletal, not heart. We don't have to send them to the ER. And I can promise you the patients are equally thrilled. Next question. Um, what is your opinion on the effects of systemic poverty and um, food deserts on cardiac health? I think this is probably the biggest issue right now. And so much so that I'm actually starting um, working in the ninth poorest county in the country. It's called Lake County outside of Napa Valley. Um, actually, it's been in the news lately because the fires that you're seeing in Napa Valley is in this area. And the reason I'm going there is because I'm very lucky where I am in New York. Um, in the place that I work, there is not a food desert. In multiple different places that I have worked in the city, 10 blocks away, people could only get fast food. They couldn't get fresh food. And the disease difference was so greatly significant that the mortality rate was so high, so much higher for a 10 block difference. It's, it's sad and awful. And really geography tends to be the greatest risk factor for heart disease sometimes. It's about access. It's about access to food. And I think really if we don't figure out this food access and how to make sure everyone has fresh fruits and vegetables, there is going to be this discrepancy and disparity. What I'm doing outside of Napa and Lake County is part of a bigger initiative where these people who are of a lower, a lower access really, and a lower educational, lower socioeconomic, who really have not had um, the infrastructure in place, we're giving them the infrastructure. And I'm going into that region to give them the same tools that I have in my office here, and the same ability to diagnose, to prevent, and to treat. And on top of that, give them access to food, to exercise, and to education and guidance to show that our problem is with the system. It's not with the patients. That if we provide our patients with everything and they need to become healthy, they will. We just have to give them the tools. Thank you. Um, next question. How does spontaneous coronary artery dissection fit into this picture, especially with it being more common in women? How do we preventatively keep an eye out for these patients when they often do not have the typical cardiac risk factors, no hypertension, hyperlipidemia, or diabetes? So SCAD was not something we even understood when I was going through training. Um, so it's so interesting how this is something that we're seeing now that was always there, but it just wasn't diagnosed. And the reason behind it has more to do with hormones, more to do with estrogen and the fluctuation in hormones. So oftentimes we see it at the end of pregnancy or post-pregnancy in young women. And like you say, there's no standard risk factors. There's no cue to really grab onto to say this woman is at risk. And that's why research is so important in getting women enrolled in research trials is so critically important. So we can't figure this out as of today to know who is at greater risk. But we know that women who've had it are more likely to have it again with pregnancy and that's the one piece of the story that we do know. But the other point to this is we understand the importance of symptoms and that symptoms might be different in women. So when women come to the emergency room with different symptoms besides an elephant sitting on the chest, but it's shortness of breath or stabbing chest pain or 
palpitations or arm pain or jaw pain or nausea or vomiting. It's not classic and typical. Instead of getting ignored, which they have, they will, look, they will be looked at differently. And even young women will be looked at for the possibility of SCAD, which I promise you decade, a decade ago, that wasn't the case. And just because of that education piece, we'll be saving more women's lives. Thank you for that. And with that question, we'll um, wrap up the question section to respect your time. I'm going to turn the video over to Dr. Wilson, Dean Wilson. All right, thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Steinbaum, for just a, a, just a wonderful, wonderful presentation. You truly are an inspiration to all of us. And thank you for all the reminders of, you know, what we can do to better care for our patients and for ourselves. I'll tell you that uh, during your uh, presentation this afternoon, some of the Tinning family is sitting in online and they texted me to tell you that uh, they wanted to extend their gratitude to you being here today and how pleased Dr. Tinning would be to see that you were chosen uh, to present this year in his honor. So thank you again. I know Fred would be so proud as we all are of you. So I'd like to take this uh, chance to present to you, uh, hopefully you can see this here, uh, a plaque in uh, gratitude for your presentation today. It says Fred C. Tinning, PhD, DOED Honorary uh, at 14, uh, for Founders Day Osteopathy Lecture, ATSU, Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine, October 1st, 2020 presented to Suzanne R. Steinbaum, DO, FACC, FAHA, 94. So congratulations, thank you, Susie. We'll get this in the mail. And again, uh, thank you for all you do to uh, really make our profession shine and for all you do uh, for all of us. So uh, best, best wishes to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And to the Tinning family, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, again. Thank you all for being here. It's been a wonderful afternoon. I wish we could just keep Dr. Steinbaum here uh, for a day or two. And uh, I, I think the questions would keep coming, but we'll get you back again soon. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you. Bye-bye.